Okay, let's get started. In the last two or three classes, we have been looking at how to use an op-amp amplifier with a single power supply. So, for that, we have to level shift. It's known as level shifting. Add a voltage to the input signal uh, so that the op-amp can operate in the middle of its saturation region. Okay, the op-amp has certain saturation levels. Obviously, in order to uh, be able to apply, uh, in order to have the largest possible signal swing from the op-amp, you have to uh, set the bias, I will define these terms, in the middle of the saturation region. Okay? So, for that, we found that uh, at least when the signal is of some frequency other than DC, right? we can add signals and DC voltages using a network that consists of capacitors and resistors. Okay, so this is known as AC coupling. The circuit, in particular, that we were looking at is let's assume that this is an AC signal at some frequency omega one. Then we use a capacitor C one, and we use a resistive network to derive the DC voltage that has to be applied there. Okay. And we have the feedback network R2 and R1 and this point had to be connected to 0 volts when we had the dual supply. Now, we have to connect it to some other DC voltage, but there should be no signal component at this point, it should still be 0. So, the way to do it is by doing this and whatever DC we want there, we derive it using this one. Okay. And again, this has to be connected to ground which is common to this circuit and also the circuits that come before and after. So, we again have to use a capacitor C 2 and we use a single supply voltage. Now, to earlier when we had dual supply voltages, I had called them uh, V D D and V S S and the single supply voltage has to be equal to the sum of the two values, but I do not want to go on writing V D D plus V S S. I will call this V D D when I have a single supply that is what I will call it. It is understood that its value is whatever it is that you want. Okay. Basically, the op amp will be supplied between this and the common ground. So, what this means is that now, if you look at the characteristics of the op amp, Right. If I had plotted V naught versus the difference voltage of the op amp, what will that look like? We have done this before, right? What will it look like? Huh? Obviously, the interesting points here are the saturation levels. What are the saturation levels? Zero and VDD. Okay. So it will look like this. I will assume that the gain is so large that this part is almost vertical. Okay. Now, because it saturates at 0 and V D D, when no signal is applied, it has to be somewhere in the middle, okay, so that it can swing both ways. Okay. So, that is known as setting up of the operating point or the bias. right? So, let me first show the biasing or it is called uh, either the bias point or the operating point. All this means is when no signal is applied, there will be some certain voltages and currents in the circuit that will be established. That is the operating point of the circuit. Okay? And then on top of the operating point, you apply the signal and at various points in the circuit, there will be say currents and voltages related to the signal. So, that is the signal part. Okay, and the total voltage or current uh, is the sum of the operating point and the signal. 
okay so let me take some numbers also just for uh, the heck of it so let's say this vdd is 24 volts okay and ra and rb let's say i'll just make it make everything 100 kilo ohms 100 kilo ohms 100 kilo ohms and 100 kilo ohms okay and let's say i mean initially we are looking at only at the operating point so i'll set vi to be zero okay so what is the voltage here with respect to ground at this node what is it 24 volts obviously right so we have 24 volts here and then what is the voltage at this point huh 12 because we have a resistive divider with equal values so this is 12 volts okay and what's the voltage at this point 12 yeah so this actually other things are connected to it so you have to evaluate it but you have to also recognize that the op amp is a negative feedback if that's the case this is at 12 volts this is also at 12 volts and this is also at 12 volts and no current is flowing anywhere okay so this is at 12 volts this point is at 12 volts and this point is also at 12 volts okay what is the voltage here huh zero ah and what is the voltage here also zero okay so the input signal is has a bias value of zero and the output across the load also has a bias value of zero so that's the reason we use the capacitors and now i can also give you other examples where you do need bias values of zero like one example is the loudspeaker itself what uh, what does the loudspeaker have in it do you know what is in a loudspeaker not just the loudspeaker part of it not the rest of the gizmo how does the speaker work how does it produce sound huh ah diaphragm vibrates why does it vibrate ah magnetic field so how do you get some physical object to vibrate in presence of a magnetic field yeah you have a coil okay you place a coil in a magnetic field and pass current through it and the coil will produce its own magnetic field and these two will interact and this will move okay but basically the loudspeaker looks like a coil of wire right now it's an inductor you can't apply a dc voltage across it okay so you have to only apply alternating signals right what happens if you apply a dc across an inductor it's a short circuit essentially the you know the current in the inductor is the integral of the voltage so the current will build up to very large values and at some point it will burn out the coil so you cannot apply dc to a loudspeaker so obviously if you have to if you have a situation like this where the bias point here is 12 volts and that is the output of the amplifier you cannot stick the loudspeaker directly there okay you have to use a capacitor or you have to use a circuit which inherently has a zero bias voltage at the output okay so the earlier circuit with the dual supply that was fine right with respect to its ground this had zero volts okay so maybe i'll draw that also just for completeness so if i do this with a dual supply i don't need many of these things right but i do need other supply voltage vss this is grounded and i would have connected this here okay so this i think is a good way to also see the bias value and the signal value i'll come to the signal value soon so in this case if i plot the same v not versus ve characteristic what will it look like let me assume that this is 12 volts and that is 12 volts so the total supply voltage is still 
24 volts. What will be the characteristic of the op amp in this case? It will go from uh, minus 12 to plus 12 and in order for its output to have the maximum room on both sides, you have to bias it in the middle or 0 volts. Okay. So, now with the input signal being 0, what is the voltage here at the input? 0 volts and what is the voltage here? Also 0, here it also it is 0. Okay. So, inherently the bias point at the output is 0. So, with respect to this ground. So, potentially here you could connect a loudspeaker directly without using a capacitor. Okay. Because even if you do, you would not have any DC across it and it will there will be no damage to the speaker. Okay. This is fine. So, this is the difference. You can see that the op amp terminal voltages are all shifted by 12 volts in the other circuit with respect to ground, which is how we started off, right? We simply shifted the ground by 12 volts to make this point 0 volts and this point plus 12 volts. That's all. So, now let me apply a signal V i and see what happens, and also let me put down some more values here. Let us say that uh, R 2 is 100 kilo ohms and R 1 is uh, sorry maybe just for uh, getting nice numbers R 2 is 90 kilo ohms and R 1 is 10 kilo ohms. What is the gain of the amplifier? Huh? 9, 10 right 1 plus R 2 by R 1 it is 10. Now, let us say I apply V i which is perhaps some V p cos omega 1 p. Okay. So, the voltage here will be 0 volts I mean or rather it will be V p cos omega 1 t. So, what will be the voltage here at this point? Let us assume that C 1, C 2, C 3 have been chosen properly with the right constraints. What is it? 12 plus. So, to the operating point the signal will get added. So, you will have plus V p cos omega 1 t. What is the voltage here? At this node, so also plus V p cos omega 1 t and what is the voltage here at this node? Huh? 12 volts, you have connected a large capacitor to ground, so that voltage does not move that is the whole idea. If it moves this will not behave like an amplifier of gain 10. Okay. So, what is the voltage here at the output of the op amp? 12 volts plus 10 times V p cos omega 1 t and finally, what is the voltage across R L? Yeah, it is I mean the whole the role of C 2 is to subtract 12 volts from there. So, across R L you have 10 V p cos omega 1 t okay. and it will be exactly the same here. Here it is even easier if I just have V p cos omega 1 t the same thing appears here and across R L you will have 10 V p cos omega 1 t assuming R 2 and R 1 are still 90 kilo ohms and 10 kilo ohms. Okay. So, basically all this arrangement with capacitors and so on is so that you can operate with a single supply, but it is performing exactly the same role as before. It is taking the same input voltage V i and providing exactly the same thing to the output. Now, what is different between the two is if you measure with respect to ground the total voltage the bias voltage plus the signal voltage will look different. Okay. So, uh, so, in any circuit you have to establish the operating point first correctly and then you have to apply signals on top of it okay. and these two are kind of separate. You can have the same signal functionality that is an amplifier of gain 10 in this case something that takes V p cos omega 1 t and gives you 10 times V p cos omega 1 t. But internally the signals can all be different from each other because you have added different bias points and so on. Okay. And also when you have uh, I mean you may have circuits which require the operating point to be within some limits. Okay. So, then you may have to let us say on one side you have uh, 5 volts plus cos omega 1 t and on the other side you have other side you need uh, 8 volts plus. So, let me uh, show the picture. So, let us say I have a circuit, I have a circuit here which provides me 5 volts plus V p cos omega 1 t 
and I have another circuit here which takes in a signal, but somehow for whatever reason it requires the operating point to be 8 volts plus 8 volts. So, but it needs the same signal component Vp cos omega 1 t. How would you connect one circuit to the other? This is my first circuit, this is the second circuit. Okay, I have to feed the output of this to that one, but the operating point at the output of this is 5 volts, the operating point required at the input of this is 8 volts. So, how do you make the connection? Huh? You have to use a capacitor okay? and probably somehow you have to set 8 volts to appear here. I do not know what the supply is, so let me say it is 12 volts and then if you use R and 2 R at this point you would get 8 volts and you have to make sure that the C 1 times R product is sufficiently large for the frequency omega omega 1. Okay. So, this business of uh, so what we have done is we have coupled the signal part of it, but we have different DC voltages. So, that is why this is sometimes known as a DC blocking capacitor or uh, it is known as an AC coupling capacitor and so on. Okay. So, this is just some terminology. You go back to this circuit, this C 1 and C 2 are typically called AC coupling capacitors or coupling capacitors. And this C 3, it is not used to couple any signal, it is used to make sure that this voltage here is at ground, that is there is no signal variations there and typically that is known as a bypass capacitor. So, just to ensure that there is no signal voltage at that node at the bottom of R 1. Okay. Now, okay, this is just terminology, but the main thing you need to know is how to calculate these values in any context. So, quickly what is the constraint on C 1? Yesterday we went through this in gory detail, right? What is the constraint on C 1? R A parallel R B. So, the reactance of C 1 must be much smaller than R A parallel R B. What about C 2? Reactance must be much smaller than what? Huh? R L that is all okay. and then C 3 R 1 parallel R C parallel R D okay. or if you choose R C and R D to be very large which is desirable it is only R 1. Okay. So, this kind of calculation again you can also relate this to all the first order business that we did in the tutorials all these are individually first order circuits. right? And like I said when calculating there is not much point uh, trying to calculate the transfer function of this with all capacitors in place. We know what the role is already right, they all should behave like short circuits. So, life will be much easier if you simply assume that when calculating C 1 the other two are designed correctly. So, that they are short circuits, okay. but when you uh, draw short circuits keep in mind that it is only for uh, AC signals it will never be for DC. Okay. So, do not for instance for some other analysis do not blindly short C 3 that will do something completely different. Okay. Because what happens if you do short this for DC will this work? I just connect it to ground instead of shorting through a capacitor will this work? Huh? That is ok, but the, does the circuit even work? Why not? Connecting that is ok. So, that means that this voltage will become 0 volts, but what is the problem? Negative feedback would not work, why? And I still have the negative feedback loop right, what is the problem with the negative feedback loop? Yeah. Ah, what happens to the output of the No, I 
I'll do it like this. Okay, I'm just like a total idiot, and I want to insist that I do it like this. So what happens to the circuit? Tell me. Output of op amp is always zero. Why? One, one second. One second. Yeah, yeah. What? No, no. Don't. Uh, I mean, the, all the numbers I have written there have nothing to do with uh, the present circuit because. So all I do is this. This is at 12 volts. I designed this part correctly, and. Either I am pig headed or I simply forgot to connect C3, I connected like this, okay. And this is still 90 kilo ohms and 10 kilo ohms. Okay. And the rest of the circuit is as it is, this is 24 volts and so on. So what will happen? Pardon? Ah, will we get it? Will we get 120? I mean, what he is saying is, I mean, here we get 12 plus VA, and obviously that is correct. If uh, this is a negative feedback, these two are virtually shorted. So, that means this is 12 plus VA and this has to be 120 plus 10 times VA. Is that what we will get? What will we get? It will just saturate to 24 volts, okay. Or I mean, forget VA. If I have 12 volts here, the output operating point had to be 120 volts, okay. This is just not going to happen with a 24 volt supply. So, it will just saturate. So, there will be no output signal at all, okay. So, you try to produce 120 plus 20, uh, 10 times VA. <laughs> from an op amp whose supply voltage is 24 volts, you will get 24 volts constant output that is all, okay. So that is correct. So it will try to go towards 120 plus V i, but once it hits 24 volts, it is saturated and that is all that is there to it. So this is a problem and okay, this may look bizarre now, but in the lab I am sure many of you will forget some capacitor or uh, short something or do something of the sort and you have to go backwards, you have to measure the voltages at different points and see what the cause is and figure out, right. That is the way to debug circuits. So, essentially in this case, the operating point is not established correctly. This will not be 120 volts, of course, this will be stuck at 24 volts and this is not what you want, okay, because the op amps characteristic with these supplies are go between 0 and 24 volts. If you are set here, there is no room for the signal, okay. So, this is not what you want. The op amp has to be operating in the high gain region that is when it has all the good things of the about the op amp. Actually what happens is this will be 24 volts, what will be this voltage? What will be this voltage if this is 24 volts? Huh? Yeah, how much is that? 2.4 volts. So basically once this is saturated, none of this virtual short business is true, okay. When is the virtual short, uh, when does the virtual short happen? When the op amp is a negative feedback and the op amp has very high gain, right. In fact, now there is no feedback at all in a sense because if this is stuck at 24 volts, any change in the error voltage, there is no change in the output at all, it is saturated. So actually, although there is a wire coming back this way, once it is saturated, there is no feedback, okay. So I mean, this is just an example of uh, we came about it by let us say forgetting C3, but there are many ways in which you can screw up the bias point of a circuit and if that happens, the circuit will not work correctly, okay. So both the operating point has to be correct and the signal has to be added correctly to the operating points, okay. This is fine and I mean I have been using the word operating points and bias that is something that you hear very commonly and in fact, this is the first thing you should do in any lab exercise. So let us say you have an amplifier. Before you apply the signal, you first check and make sure that the operating points are correct, okay. This will, this is another check of whether the circuit is wired up properly or not. Of course, you look at it and see, but that does not tell you anything. This actually is an electrical measurement of if everything is set up properly. So, whenever you make an op-amp negative feedback circuit, you should check the operating point and the output should be, I mean, neither at the positive nor the negative saturation, but somewhere in the middle, wherever you want it to be. And also, if you look at the operating point here and there, they should be very close to each other, right? Because the, it is operating in negative feedback and it is virtually shorted. 
of course this does not apply if you use an op amp in a circuit which is intentionally not in negative feedback ok sometimes you do that, but uh, the key to debugging any circuit is first you check the operating point ok that will tell you a lot of things and then after that you can see otherwise I mean simply looking at the scope and saying the signal is not coming I mean it will not get you very far. Any questions about any of this AC coupling business, operating point of op amps and so on? So, you can say you can operate the op amp with any supplies. I mean, the commonly used ones are either you use a single supply uh, voltage between the positive and negative supply uh, terminals of the op amp, or you use dual supplies with equal positive and negative voltages, ok. The convenience there is uh, like most of the time you can avoid these AC coupling capacitors if you use dual supplies. Then the operating point of the op amp can be set to be 0. So, then there is no voltage to add or subtract you can simply apply the signals ok. Any questions about any of these things? So, I said that uh, R and R B right. What did I say about R and R B? How would you choose them? R A R B or R C R D, how would you choose them? I mean, what is important is the ratio, right? That will set the voltage correctly. But what about the absolute values? I chose 100 kilo ohms and 100 kilo ohms. Could I choose 1 mega ohm and 1 mega ohm? Will it work? Yes or no? Yeah, it will work as far as establishing the voltage is concerned, whether you use 200 kilo ohms or 2 1 mega ohms, it is the same. And let us assume that the current going into the op amp is 0. So, it does not matter what value you choose, you could even choose 10 mega ohm, ok. So, what do you think actually is the effect of these things? As far as the DC voltage there is concerned, there is no effect, right. Whether you choose 10 kilo ohms or 100 kilo ohms or 1 mega ohms, it has no effect, ok. Huh? Cost, is that what you said? Ok. Possibly, huh? yeah, it has effect on power loss, that is why we want to use very high uh, values, ok. So, you can use very high values, then if you choose these to be very high, the C1 becomes lower and lower for the constraint, ok. So, for instance, if I increase RA by a factor of 10, I could actually reduce C1 by a factor of 10 also for keeping the same. I mean for uh, satisfying the constraint by the same margin, ok. So, you can do that, you can go on increasing it. Now, finally, the constraint will come from the fact that first of all the current here may not be 0, there will actually be a small current flowing into the op amp. So, then that means that the current in this branch cannot become below a certain value. So, that is one of the things. Also, this R A parallel R B times C 1 product ok. This has to be larger than something right, that is the constraint that we got. This has to be basically larger than uh, 1 by omega 1. What is the effect of uh, going crazy with this? Let us say yesterday I said you make it 10 times or 20 times more that is probably sufficient, but let us say I make it 10,000 times more. What is the effect? Yesterday I also mentioned that choosing a very large value of C 1 may have some cost implication. But let us not get into that, let us not worry about economics for now. What do you think will happen if I make this R times C very, very large? What aspect of the circuit may that influence? Exactly. So, what happens is once you start up, once you apply 24 volts, it will take longer time for voltages to settle, ok. So, that may be a problem in some cases. So, that is also the reason why you do not want to go crazy with this. And another small I guess sort of trivia. So, let us not worry about the input side of things. So, let us say this is at 12 volts ok as it is supposed to be or maybe I will show it like this. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 
so that's why the question i now asked was different i didn't ask about r versus c i said if i simply make this is the constraint let's say i over design by the over uh, do the constraint by a large amount okay so instead of choosing 10 times this i choose like 10000 times that okay the whole product i am increasing not just uh, r and then reducing c to So this is all. This also has a capacitor. So let's just look at this part of the circuit. Okay. So this 24 volts. Let's say you turn it on. That is, you turn on the switch. So that means that this voltage goes from 0 to 24 volts. Okay. What will happen to this voltage? It will also jump from 0 to 12 volts. What will happen to this voltage? confusing do not worry about it let us say that this is somehow connected to a 12 volts fixed supply ok. So, what will happen to this voltage? Huh? Actually maybe I should do this yeah. let me have the capacitor here. What happens there? So, it will also somehow jump to 12 volts maybe it will take some time but uh, in fact what it will do is if you calculate correctly it will do that ok. What happens to this voltage? Hmm? Will it be 0? Take time, I mean it was already 0, what does it have to take time for? First there will be? Yeah, it will jump and actually I mean if you just look at this part of the circuit and look at the step response, what is it? It will first jump by the value of the step because the capacitor is a short and then the capacitor will slowly charge up and this output voltage will fall to 0 right. So, let us say this is a step and you apply it to C and R what will be the voltage across this? Initially it is equal to it will jump along with this and then fall to 0 right. This is again you something that you calculated in the first order case ok. Have you experienced the result of this somewhere? This is why I think most of the amplifiers when you turn on there will be a loud click or a pop right because across the loudspeaker you will get some voltage like this ok. Now, this can also be important in some cases I mean this is just I am giving you some practical trivia that is all something relating aspect of the circuit to something that you would have already observed. Most of the audio amplifiers do this when you turn on there will be some click in the or a bang in the loudspeaker. Now, this can be particularly dangerous if you are wearing headphones. So, I think in those cases there is there will be some special circuits to make sure that it starts up softly right. So, let us say you are wearing headphones and then turn it on and then there is a loud bang I mean I do not think this result is very pleasant pleasant ok. So, that is also that also can be important and there are these soft start circuits to take care of those things. Okay, so enough about AC coupling and all these things. Let's see what should we do next. So let me quickly go through another example. So let me take the inverting amplifier. with a dual supply the load is connected like this ok. Now, I want to make this operate with a single supply. So, what should I do quickly? What are all the things I need to do? Hmm? How do I operate this with a single supply? That is, what is the supply voltage I should choose? 
obviously VCC plus VSS. Okay. Now, what? Huh? Voltage divider to do what? I mean, where should I put a voltage divider? Okay, I put a voltage divider because you wanted it. Fine. What should I do with this? Hmm? So, let us go step by step. Uh, I have my VI here. What should I do with this? Capacitor. Okay, C1 and then connect it to where? R1 and connect it there, then eh? capacitor between. Okay, and where do I connect the plus thing to? Between the resistors, and then the output. Is that it or is there something else? I have to connect R2 also. What should I do? Okay. Then yeah. So that's all that's there to it, right? So you don't need to actually bias this further because this is kind of this is at 12 volts now or the midpoint. So, because of DC negative feedback around the op amp this also will have the same bias. So, you do not need to separately set the bias of the terminal. Okay. So, this will work an extremely important thing to when you are doing all these things is the op amp still have to have op amp still has to have negative feedback for DC ok. Otherwise, it would not work at all this we will uh, see. So, for instance I mean in particular we will go into the details of this later you do not want to do this in any circumstance ok. The feedback path around the op amp right the feedback around the op amp has to be working for DC there could be multiple feedback paths Maybe in that case like some of them work for DC some of them do not. But if you break the DC negative feedback loop around the op amp, the operating point itself will not be established. Okay, the operating point of the op amp is basically the DC operating point, right? So for that to be established, there has to be negative feedback around the op amp. Okay, so we will get into this uh, soon. So while like fooling around with coupling and bypass capacitors and so on, you don't want to have AC coupling for all the feedback paths around the op amp. You have to have DC negative feedback. Okay. Any questions about this? So, quickly, what is the constraint? C1. What is the constraint on C1 here? What is it? Yes, there are so many volunteers, I will pick some. Yes, Narayan. Yes, Narayan. Yeah. What is the constraint on C1? What have we been doing so far? Santosh Kumar? Santosh Kumar, not here. Yeah. It's not a why are a parallel RB? So, 1 over omega 1 C 1 must be much more than R 1. What about C 2? C 2, what is it? Hmm? The reactance of C 2 should be much smaller than which resistance? R L, yeah. And similarly, C 3. Yeah, 
it's a little tricky you have to make c3 large but the point is if you assume that the op amps input current is zero so this voltage will always be zero okay so actually no current even flows through that isn't it even if i didn't have c3 what will be the voltage here the signal component of the voltage it won't change at all it turns out what you do actually in practice put c3 again we will get into uh, why later okay because i mean what i'm saying is you can have a resistance if you are guaranteed that the current is zero this voltage will be zero right so which is what we wanted so it's a little more uh, uh, involved to find out what c3 is but you do put c3 and then make it larger than much larger than the resistance of r and rb and that should be fine okay any questions here so we looked at this ac coupling and uh, the reason or the way we came up with these uh, capacitors was to say that essentially we need batteries or dc voltages for shifting the levels and we approximated those dc voltages using capacitors which are charged to the right voltage of course it's not as though we first charge the capacitors and then apply the signal if you simply apply both the power supply and the signal together the dc across the capacitors will go to the right value eventually and the signal also will take the right values uh, in steady state okay so that's how it really works now another way to think about it is what we wanted is let's say at the input of the op amp at the input of the op amp when we were using a single supply we wanted some dc voltage so let's say 12 volts plus some signal okay so in general we wanted to add two voltages okay so let's say like forget everything that we have done before uh you wanted to add two voltages how would you do it using passive circuits how would you do that or in general let me not even say add two voltages i have voltages v1 and v2 and i had to take a linear combination of them so what would i do what should i do what will give you a linear combination what's that how can you get a linear combination i mean you must have heard the term linear combination so many times right so where do you get linear combination huh what's that series no no let's say you can't do that i mean i'm saying v1 and v2 are both you can't stack them in series because this bottom terminal is constrained to be ground i mean where have you heard the term linear combination where have you used it before ha huh? superposition that's fine so what is the circuit that gives you superposition what is not the circuit what kind of circuit give you superposition so very general thing right any linear circuit so you stick this into any linear circuit you will get alpha v1 plus beta v2 maybe the alpha and beta are not what you want but it is always going to give you that okay so one i mean just tell me like one simple way so let's say i want to get half v1 plus half v2 how would i get that huh putting resistors where okay let's say i want to do this using resistors two resistors okay so in general if i use r1 and r2 what will i get here what's the voltage there hmm what's the voltage here this is a perfectly linear circuit with resistors okay what's that what do we get i want all the voltages with reference to this ground right i want this voltage with respect to this ground what is it that i'm going to get ah v1 minus v2 why i want that voltage with respect to the ground which i 
pointed out, right? What is the difficulty here? V1? Yeah, so again I already hinted at the linear combination, right? It is V1 times something plus V2 times something. What is V1 times what? what is this? R2 by R1 plus R2. I already said so many things about superposition. You said V2 to 0, you get a voltage division. And then you said V1 to 0, you get a complementary ratio, right? R1 by R1 plus R2. So, this already gives you like sum of two voltages, but it has these weights which are less than 1, and also you cannot adjust them independently, right? If one increases, the other decreases, and so on, okay? But let us say that V1 and V2 are at different frequencies. This is at omega 1 and this is at omega 2, okay. And these resistors were something that I put here, it, they do not have to be resistors, okay. So, let us say there are some general impedances Z1 and Z2, okay. So, what happens then? What will you get? It is exactly the same, but the important difference is that, what is the important difference? Z2 here and then here instead of R's I have Z's, is that all? I mean I just substitute R by Z, huh? they are functions of frequency. In fact, it is very misleading to write it like this. This number has to be evaluated at omega 1, this is at omega 2, okay. So, now uh, and the Z's themselves can be functions of frequency, okay. Now, I want this to be approximately V1 plus V2, okay. That is, I do not want a, I do not want V1 to be reduced by some factor and V2 to be by, by some other factor. I just want V1 plus V2, but now I have the freedom, uh, one degree of freedom that there are at different frequencies. So, how should I choose the impedances? No, no, forget about, I mean just tell me mathematically, I mean you have the algebra here, right. So, what should happen to the, each of those numbers is a frequency dependent number in general. So, what should happen? I told you, what's that? Z2 should be equal to Z1. Yeah, so Z2 at omega 1 must be much more than Z1 at omega 1, okay. That will make this number almost equal to 1 and at omega 2 the opposite must be true. So, that makes the other number also much greater than 1, okay. So, now what are the choices? So, let us say, I mean let us look at now the particular case, let us say V 1 is D C, what is omega 1 then? 0 and omega 2 is some number, okay. So, what can I use for Z1 and Z2? So, this means that the DC value of Z2 must be much more than the DC value of Z1, okay. And the AC or omega 2 value of Z1 must be much more than that. So, what can I use for Z1 and Z2? So, Z1, if Z1 is a resistor and Z2 is a capacitor, this will for sure work and this is the circuit we have used, right. So, what happens is that at DC, this is an open circuit. So, obviously, any resistance is, I mean any resistance is going to be much smaller than its impedance, okay. Now, quickly, what are the other possibilities? So, obviously, you can also use an inductor here with the right value and use this and then what else? Uh, something else is remaining, right? What is that? Which way should be the left one? Uh, Z1 is inductor or resistor? Right? Yeah. See, this is a DC signal, okay. So, you can use a DC short here. This is an AC signal. So, you can use an AC short here. So, that is an inductor and a capacitor. So, similarly, you can also use inductor and resistor or resistor and capacitor. So, this is the most frequently used, the upper one, but the other ones are also used 
It's because at low frequencies the inductance values become large and very bulky that you don't use them, but at high frequencies you do use such things. Okay. The advantage of the inductor is that uh, they are really like it has zero DC resistance, right? Zero impedance at DC, so that's uh, that can be an advantage. Okay. Okay. So we will continue on about these things. <coughs>